Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hope you guys are doing well. Now, this is a topic that I think is going to stump some people this morning, and so I want to be sure to chat through it. And our topic that we're talking through today is the number one sin that sends Christians, yes, you heard that right, that sends a Christian to hell. And some of you guys may, may be going, wait a second, Jill, is this biblical? I thought that we were saved by grace. I thought that Jesus covered our sins. Well, it is biblical, and I want to show you some scripture on this, okay? And so that's what we're diving into today. Good morning to you guys as you're hopping on. But we're talking about the number one sin that sends Christians, believers, guys, people who are going to church, living right with their walk with God, well, almost living right. We're about to talk about that in a second. Um, but that sends Christians to hell unnecessarily. And I think this is such the tragic part of this, ladies and gents, because you can have a Christian who is leading a mostly good life, who's going to church, who's trying to do right, who's talking to people about Jesus, and this one thing can still trip us up and really get us into a lot of trouble if we don't pay attention to it in our personal lives. Hey, Vicki, good morning. Glad you hopped on today. So that's what we're talking about. And so do you guys have any guesses on what this is? What do you think the number one sin is that sends many Christians to hell unnecessarily? If you've got ideas, you can type it in the comments. And I want to tell you guys up front, I have got a ton of scriptures that we're talking through today because I want you guys to know that this is biblical. I want you guys to see what the Bible has to say about it. And I also want to say, I've got a lot of scriptures for us this morning, but they are, they are just the tip of the iceberg. There are so many more scriptures on this one particular topic in the Bible about this particular thing. And so whenever the Bible says something over and over and over again, that should get our attention. Amen? Because if Jesus in particular is repeating himself, it's because he's trying to warn us. It's because he is trying to say, hey, this is an important thing. Ding, ding, ding. You need to pay attention to this thing, right? Hey, everybody. Good morning. Lots of you guys. Um, is it John Muir? I, I'm notorious for butchering names. Good morning. Forrest, it's good to see you. Charlie, um, so awesome to see you guys. So we will go ahead and dive into this, and I'm going to let the cat out of the bag. I'm going to tell you what it is, okay? Our topic today for the number one sin that sends many Christians to hell unnecessarily is unforgiveness. Okay, and so, you know, I wanted to start off with a story before we get into this. Um, so, here's the deal, you guys. There was a very famous minister. You guys are bringing up blasphemy. That's also a really good point. Not what we're talking about today, but that's a great guess. Um, so, uh, here's the deal. There was a very famous minister who basically stood in front of a congregation, and they talked about this topic of unforgiveness. And what happened when they were standing before everybody is they gave an altar call after they gave this whole spiel. And they said, whoever in this room is dealing with unforgiveness, come forward and we will pray for you guys. And I want you guys to guess how much in terms of a percentage, how many people actually responded to that. Do you guys have any guesses? And these, this was a mostly Christian crowd. I'll give you a little bit of a hint. There were a few unbelievers in there, but for the most part, this was a Christian conference and the large majority of people in there were unbelievers. Let's play a game here. You guys have a guess, type it in the comments for how, what percentage of people in that big room responded to this altar call saying that, yes, I've been in a place of unforgiveness towards so-and-so I need to repent. You guys have any guesses? It's kind of a cheat because I've told some of you guys this before, I think, in a story. So if you've been following this page for a long time, you've probably heard it before. So here's, here's the percentage. You guys ready for this? It shocked me when I heard about this. And, you know, we actually see similar numbers being reported a lot in the church today. 80%, 80% of Christians report that they struggle with unforgiveness currently in their personal lives, okay? That's a huge number. That means that if you line up 10 Christians randomly and they're, you know, people who are going to church, serving, maybe even be in leadership positions. These could be pastors. These could be all kinds of different people, right? If you line up 10 Christians in a row, that means that about 8 out of 10 of those people are struggling with unforgiveness. That should get our attention. 
ladies and gents. That's kind of scary, is it not? And, you know, the fact that the Bible says that if we don't deal with this stuff, Jesus will not forgive us of our sins and we could end up in hell, that's a scary thought, ladies and gents. And it's something that just, you guys have heard me be vulnerable about this area before in my life, too. This is not something that came easy to me. You know, this is still not something that comes easy to me sometimes. Because a lot of the times the reason that we struggle with unforgiveness is due to the fact that somebody did something really bad to us, really unfair to us, right? And so a lot of the times the reason that our flesh just wrestles with this is because we were hurt, because it was really wrong, right? And so I want to talk to all of us today about how do we process this and what does the Bible have to say about this topic? Because I think that, you know, in our current culture, we kind of have a culture of, you know, once you give your life to Jesus, you know, it's one and done and there's nothing else that we're responsible for in our personal lives. This is why it's so important as a Christian that you stay plugged into your Bible. That's, you know, that's part of it. But if we've got areas of our life like unforgiveness that we have not dealt with, we are putting ourselves in a very dangerous situation, ladies and gents. You know, there's... Um, even a lot of testimonials, if you guys want to go look this up in your free time, of people on YouTube or other places who they come on and they say, you know what, I actually, I was a Christian, I was going to church, I was doing a lot of the quote unquote right things in my life, I fully believed in Jesus, I had a relationship with him, I was praying, and yet I held unforgiveness against one, or one person or a few people in my life. And they ended up in hell. And God sent them back to tell their story to try to save other people. Now, regardless of whether or not you believe those accounts are true, we do believe the Bible is true. Amen? And so those accounts line up with what the Bible has to say about this topic. And so it's really, really critical that we dive into this and that we dig into this. Because think about this. Imagine that those statistics were pretty accurate, okay? Let's say that 8 out of every 10 Christians who are walking around in church buildings all over the world, you know, are holding unforgiveness against someone. How crazy is that, you guys? That should really, really just get our attention. And, you know, the Bible talks about how there's this huge traffic numbers going to hell, but it's a narrow way to get to heaven, right? And, you know, it's reasons like this that largely contribute to that. Amen? And so... Let's talk about this today. Again, I've got a lot of scripture. And just know that when I'm talking to you about this concept, know that this is something that I've struggled with myself. So this is not me coming at you with condemnation. This is all of us needing to work through this together so that we can help each other not to fall into the traps and the snares that Satan has for us. Amen. All right. So let's talk through this today, okay? All right. So I wanted to start off with kind of a silly analogy because I think this is kind of funny, but it helps me a lot when it comes to this concept of unforgiveness. All right. Let's say that you have a sweet little dog. That's your family pet. Okay. And the dog comes one day and they poop on the floor on your carpet. All right. You know, you're probably going to be a little bit angry in the moment, right? Just because you're like, oh man, you know, I'm going to have to clean this up. This is really not fun. You know, the dog knows better than this. But at the end of the day, are you going to forgive that dog? Yes, you're going to forgive the dog, right? Because why? Because it's a dog. It's the nature of a dog to be a dog, right? <laughs> you know, like sometimes they do stuff and you just, you know, you kind of write it off because you're like, well, it's a dog. They're going to be a dog sometimes, right? So I think that so often what happens in our lives is a lot of times we will hold Christians to a higher standard and we'll go, I expected the unbeliever to hurt me. I expected the unbeliever to do this thing to me that was really, really bad. But so-and-so was a Christian. So-and-so was a pastor. So-and-so was in a place of leadership, right? And they did this to me. And, you know, we, we get into this place where we're like, I can't believe it. I can't believe that this person who says that they're on fire for Jesus, who claims this stuff, would do this horrible thing to me in my personal life. Well, I want to tell you guys that we are dumb sheep, okay? And I don't mean that in an ugly way. I don't mean that in a derogatory way towards you. I'm including myself in this. But the Bible talks about how we are in need of a shepherd. Amen. And it talks about the nature of sheep is not very smart. You know, I read a book <laughs> um, a while back on the nature of sheep, and it was incredible incredible how much sheep need a shepherd to survive like they do not do well on their own they will not make it and so what's what's crazy is you know our character as a sheep 
continues with us a lot of the time. We live in a fallen world right now, right? And so we desperately need the wisdom, the direction of Jesus in our personal lives in order to move forward and to make good decisions. But you know what? As long as we're here on the earth, our flesh still rears up sometimes. Amen? Even if we are fully saved, we're a new creation in Christ, yes, but it doesn't still mean that we won't struggle against flesh and blood. It doesn't still mean that the enemy won't still try to come against us in our personal lives. And it definitely doesn't mean that we don't still need direction and wisdom. Amen. Hello, who am I talking to today? And so I like to think of it this way. This is kind of a cool analogy that I like to throw out there. Hey, Pastor Irwin, good to see you. Um, so here's an analogy that I like to throw out there. I want you to imagine that we're all dumb sheep, Christians and non-Christians alike, but the saved Christians have a parachute on, okay? That parachute represents the blood of the cross. That parachute represents Jesus' sacrifice for us. So did our nature change? You know, we're still sheep, right? We still need a shepherd. We still need guidance. We still need to be taken care of. The, the primary difference is, you know, one sheep has a parachute on. The other sheep has not accepted Jesus and doesn't have a parachute on. Amen? And so when you think about it this way, and again, this is not to be ugly to anybody or anything, it helps you to have a lot more grace when a Christian in your life messes up, you know, because we're all sheep, right? And sheep are not very smart animals. Hello? And so we need that shepherd. We need God's guidance. But it's not to say that even after we get saved, even when we're trying our hardest, even Christians are capable of messing up from time to time. Now, does that excuse us staying in a place of sin? Of course not. We need to repent. We need to get rid of that bad behavior. We need to move on, you know, and try to do right by Jesus, okay? But all of that to say, I think that so often I've talked to so many Christians who struggle with unforgiveness, and that's one of the first things that I hear out of their mouth is, I can't believe that they were a Christian and they did this to me. And it's like, yeah, they're, they're a dumb sheep, right? We're all sheep. Okay, and you know, the main difference is some are covered by the blood of Jesus and some have not accepted him yet, you know, but it doesn't change the fact that we still need a shepherd and that our nature is not to be very smart without Jesus, right? That's why we need his guidance, his love, his protection in our personal lives, okay? All right, so a lot of you guys have heard my story of unforgiveness, but I want to tell you um, a little bit about a season that I went through many, many years ago now in my life. And if you don't believe that God tests leaders in the areas that he comes to talk to you guys about, I want to tell you he tests us in this stuff, okay? And so <laughs> um, I went through a season of testing in my life where I started off not passing the test very well. How many of you guys are grateful that when we don't pass the test, God will let us circle back around the mountain sometimes until we decide to get obedient, amen? And that was the case for me when I was much younger. So I had a scenario that I faced, and I don't want to get into a ton of details, where a person had done something really, really wrong to me, okay? And they were basically trying to destroy everything about me, my career, my character, X, Y, Z, and it was, you know, uncalled for, okay? This was not because I had done anything wrong to them, per se. It was just they, you know, they had junk on their life. How many of you guys know that hurting people hurt people sometimes? Amen? And so this was a, a great case of someone who had junk on their life, and as a result of them not dealing with their junk, they were taking it out on someone else, okay? And so, basically, that was the situation, and I was in a place of unforgiveness, amen? I was in a place of unforgiveness towards the situation, because it was like every single time I tried to move forward, this person would hit me again. This person was out to spitefully use me. This person was out with a vengeance to try to come against my life, and it was not a situation where I could easily separate myself from this. Um, a lot of you guys are very familiar with those scenarios. And so I was in this place, and I went for several months where I just let this bitterness and this bitter root creep up in my heart. I was in a place of offense. And we've already talked about in a previous teaching that if you are in a place of offense, you are immediately in a place of deception. Amen? Because offense comes with deception. Scripture talks about that. We don't have time for that today. And so I was in this place of bitterness. I was in this place of unforgiveness. I had, you know... Um, let the sun go down on my anger and I held on to that anger. I did not do what scripture said to release that thing to the Lord and to be obedient. And so what happened was I noticed some really, really scary changes in my life. Over the course of those few months, it was probably only three or four months, 
um, that I was in this, but it was enough to teach me a lesson. How many of you guys know that? And I was in this season and basically all of the wrong friend groups started coming around me. It was like they were attracted to me like a magnet. And these weren't even horrible people, but they were Christians who were also in some junk. Who am I talking to today? Because when you're in a place of offense, it attracts offense a lot of the time, right? And so I started noticing these attacks against my life. And I started noticing that it felt like when I prayed, just nothing was happening. You know, it just felt like my prayers were just going nowhere. And there was all of this hard stuff that kept hitting my life. It was like, you know, the devil just was hitting me with sickness, with all this stuff in my life. And it just kept coming one after another after another. And, you know, it wasn't just normal levels of warfare. What had happened was I had allowed an open door for the enemy to come in and to attack my life because I was in a place of disobedience toward this person that I needed to forgive. And a lot of times we don't understand the repercussions of our actions when we're in a place of disobedience. And, you know, part of the reason the Bible tells us to be obedient in these areas is because if we're not obedient, it provides an open door for the enemy to come in and to attack your life that you wouldn't have to go through if we would just get obedient. And that was very much what was happening to me. And, you know, I was blinded a lot in that time because I was holding on to this grudge. I was holding on to this place of offense. I was in a place of bitterness. And you know what? Here's the crazy part, you guys. Why do we hold on to that a lot of the time? A lot of times we hold on to that because we want to punish the other person. We want them to see that we're angry. We want them to see, you know, that they hurt us, X, Y, Z, whatever it may be. And, you know, half the time, that person doesn't even know you're mad at them. Can we have truth talk today? Or even if they do know that you're mad at them, they're out living their life. They're having fun. They're not losing sleep at night. You're the one who's losing sleep at night over this stuff. Amen? And so I'll never forget the journey that God started me walking on when he wanted me to get obedience in this area of my life and towards this particular person. And the very first thing that he wanted me to do was to make a decision to forgive. I want to tell you guys today that forgiveness a lot of the time starts with a decision and not just an emotion. Sometimes it takes a time period for you to line up with your emotions with the decision that you are making to get obedience. Amen. And a lot of that comes through prayer. And I want to talk about that in a second. You know, the Bible talks about how we need to work out our salvation from a place of fear and trembling. Amen. You know, your salvation is at stake over this, ladies and gents. And I don't care how petty it was. I don't care what they did to you here in the natural. I know it was not right. I know it was purposely ugly a lot of the time. But it is not worth you losing your salvation. It is not worth you going to hell over this stuff, ladies and gents. It's not. We have got to learn how to forgive, ladies and gents. And so this is the journey that God had me walk through when it came to this place of forgiveness. The very first thing that he asked me to do when I said, God, I need to get obedient, I repent for walking in unforgiveness towards this person, is he said, you need to pray for this person on a regular basis. And I was like, oh, God. <laughs> because at this point, I had allowed what the Bible calls a bitter root to set into my spirit. Here's why it's so important that we deal with things like this very, very quickly. Because if you don't let the sun go down on your anger, if you deal with things quickly, it's much easier to get that junk off of you. But if you let this stuff sit in your spirit for months or years or whatever it may be, think about like a root system on a plant. If you plant a plant and it's only got a little bit of roots to it because it's only been planted a few days, you can pop that sucker out of, up out of the soil pretty quickly and easily, right? But then I want you to imagine that there's been a plant that's been in the soil for years. Maybe you're trying to dig up a tree and get the root system gone. You guys know that that root system is massive. And so when you wait longer to deal with stuff, it is much harder to uproot this junk off of your life. It is much harder to uproot those years of bitterness, of offense, of unforgiveness that you have been holding against other people. And so that was the case with me. I had let this go on way too long in my personal life. This had been several months of me holding on to this junk against this person. And I was dealing with a bitter root. I was dealing with something that was a stronghold in my life that I was going to have to uproot. And so for me, it was going to take a little bit longer of a process to get obedient and to deal with this thing now because I had let this thing go so long. Amen. And so what God had me do was he had me start to pray for this person that was still unrepentant. Let me just say that. This was not a person who was walking in a place of repentance yet. I never got an apology from this person. This person never completely shaped up in this area, okay? And I was still required to forgive. So often we are waiting on, well, I'll forgive you if 
you apologize to me. I'll forgive you if you do this stuff. And God's going, no, because it's corrupting your heart when you do that. So we've got to be willing to forgive even if we never get those answers that we're looking for. Sometimes you have to give yourself closure over a situation and you've got to say, God, it's your job you know, for justice and vengeance over the situation, should you choose to take it, God. My job is to make sure that my heart is right with you so that I can be in a good place. Amen? And so we've got to be willing to give this stuff to God and to let him deal with situations and fight our battles. But as long as our hand is on it, God's not fighting for it a lot of the time. We've got to be willing to do things his way if we want his intervention over our situations. Amen. And so God said, you need to start praying for this person. And I wanted to read you a very, very important scripture that helped me throughout my process of getting this bitter root out of my heart and dealing with this place of unforgiveness many years ago. So it's Matthew 5, 44. It says, but I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That was this person that fell into my category that I was struggling with. And I remember I, I had kind of known the scripture, but I had kind of shrugged it to the side and forgotten about it. And when God highlighted it, he said, you know that spitefully use and persecute you? That's the person who often needs your prayers the most, ladies and gents. And yet that's so often the person that we are unwilling to pray for a lot of the time. And God said, if you really want to work through this unforgiveness jump that you have let build up in your heart, Jill, you need to start praying for these people. And it says, you know, do good to those who hate you. And so often we're praying, you know, that God would just get them back and that, you know, he would provide justice and he would show them the error of their ways and God's going, but are you praying good for that person? That's hard on our flesh, isn't it, ladies and gentlemen? That can be some tough stuff, but we're having truth talk today, okay? So when God told me to start praying for this person, my prayers were kind of fleshly. Can we, can we just have truth talk? My prayers were not very nice about this situation. And they started off really short and sweet to the point because, to be honest, I did not want to pray for this person. I was doing it to be obedient. Can we, can we have some truth talk today? So they started off like this. God bless them, and then I'd be done, right? And then God started telling me, he was like, you need to start, you know, not just praying for them to you know, realize the error of their ways and to quit being this way and blah, blah, blah. He said, you need to start praying blessings over their life. My prayer started off from a very bitter place towards this person. And it started off with you, 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 you need to realize what you did to me. You need to realize what you did wrong and all this stuff. And God shifted the trajectory of my prayers. And he said, Jill, I want you to pray blessings over this person now. I don't want your prayers to be focused on all of that. I want you to pray blessings. And he took me through a process with this stuff. And so eventually I started praying for them. I knew this person's desires of their hearts to a certain extent. I was close enough to know some of that about this person. And so, you know, God had me start praying blessings over their finances, blessings over the desires of their heart. And, you know, the more that I started to pray blessings over this person, the more God showed me what this person was struggling with, the more God showed me his heart towards this person, the more God showed me kind of his stance towards this individual that had been giving me a hard time. And it gave me some empathy. It didn't excuse their wrong behavior. Amen. But it gave me some empathy towards the situation. It showed me how God viewed this person more through the process of praying for them. And God would not let me let up. He said, Jill, until you feel like this person does not owe you anything, until the bitterness and offense in your heart is gone, you need to pray for them until you hit that place. It's good you started with a decision to forgive. But as long as you've got that junk in your spirit, you're not done yet. That was what God told me personally. You guys can pray about that for yourself. Um, with your personal situations, but I'm telling you guys what God walked me through. And so by the end of this process of learning to pray blessing over them every day, and God would get on to me if I was not consistent with this, because you got to be consistent in order to get this junk out of your spirit, right? And this praying for your enemies process is what helps you to uproot those roots of bitterness and offense that you've had sitting in your spirit for long periods of time. And so what I did was I prayed for this over a long period of time. And towards the end of this time period, when I got closer to completely letting go of this situation and forgiving this person, you know, I was praying for them like I would pray for one of my friends at the end. You know, I was praying blessings over their life. I was praying, you know, that God would comfort them, that God would help them and all this stuff. And it just really cleansed my spirit and helped me to get into a place of obedience. Amen. So all of that to say, 
if you are having a hard time with your feelings lining up, a lot of the time, the thing that you can do to help you in this place of forgiveness towards forgiving an enemy, someone who's spitefully persecuting you, hello, who am I talking to? Someone who is not easy to forgive, someone who is unrepentant, is a lot of the time what you can do is pray for them and pray for them regularly. Because what it's doing is it's not only helping them, but it's getting your spirit in alignment. It's helping to get that flesh out of your spirit so that you can walk in a place of victory. Amen. So I wanted to read you a few scriptures, as I promised, on uh, this topic of unforgiveness and to show you this is something we've got to take seriously. You know, that person's pettiness, that person, whatever they did wrong to you, it is not worth you ending up in hell. It is not worth your, you, you know, your salvation being at risk, ladies and gents. It's just not, okay? So let's read what the Bible has to say about this. Mark eleven twenty five, And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who is also in heaven may forgive you of your trespasses, okay? So there's, there's a condition here, okay? God's saying, if you want me to forgive your sins, if you want that grace over your life, if you want the grace to be able to hang out with me one day in heaven, you've got to release these people, you know, because guess what? You've sinned a lot in your life too. You're that dumb sheep just like they are, and you've done a lot of junk in your life, and I'm willing to forgive you. It's a double standard if you don't forgive them over that thing that they did to you. Amen? Those who are, have been forgiven much are required to forgive much. Never forget that, ladies and gents. Those who have been forgiven much are required to forgive much. And so a lot of Christians don't get how scary this is when we hold on to this junk in our hearts. But God says, if you want your sins forgiven, if you want to be covered by my grace, if you want to be safe, quote unquote, you've got to be willing to do this for other people as well. And yes, even the people who did you really, really wrong. Amen. It's not say what they did against you is right. They're going to have to answer to Jesus for that one day. Amen. But it is to say that if we want our sins forgiven, we've received so much grace from Jesus over our lives. We also have to be willing to give that grace as well. Okay. Matthew 6, 14 through 15. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. You know what I like to do a lot of times when I'm studying my Bible? I will go through and every time I see the word if, I will circle that because it's a conditional statement. You guys know what I'm talking about today? So what does that mean? It means it's not automatic. It means that there is something required from us a lot of the time in order for the second part of that statement to be true and come to pass. This is what Matthew 6, 14 through 15 is talking about. It says, for if you forgive others their trespasses against you, your heavenly Father is going to forgive you. But if you don't, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. It's pretty simple. If we want our sins forgiven, if we want to be covered by the grace of Jesus Christ, if we want to be in a good place with God, we have to be willing to forgive other people of their sins against us and to get obedient in this area of our lives. Ephesians 4.32, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Again, it's that reminder, you know, God forgave you, we've got to be willing to forgive other people. Ephesians 4.26-27, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Give no opportunity to the devil. This is a powerful scripture. We need to hang out on this one for a second, okay? It says, do not let the sun go down on your anger. Remember when I talked to you guys about how I had this root of bitterness, this offense that was sitting in my spirit, and it was much harder for me to uproot because I had let it sit there for a long time? This is what this scripture is talking about. When it says, don't let the sun go down on your anger, there's a reason for it. Because if you deal with that stuff quickly when it tries to come on you, it's much easier to let go of and to be obedient with. But if you let that thing sit there in that place of disobedience for a long time, it can cause you major, major issues. And the last part of this scripture is also really critical as well. It says, and give no opportunity to the devil. So here's the deal. When we hold on to anger, unforgiveness, bitterness, offense against someone or a situation, we are giving an opportunity for the devil to come in and to afflict our lives. And you guys heard from my story and my testimony of when I was holding on to unforgiveness back in the day about how that's exactly what happened to me. 
to the T is what happened to me. I encountered crazy attack on my personal life. And a lot of it was because I was in a place of disobedience. A lot of Christians don't understand that they're going through unnecessary attack and warfare just because they're not dealing with this place in their personal lives, okay? All right, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, okay? So if we've been in a place of unforgiveness towards someone, we need to confess it, say, God, I confess that I have been in a place of unforgiveness against so-and-so, insert person or person's name, right? And say, God, I pray that you would cleanse me from this unrighteousness. You know, help me to pray for this person. Help to get this junk out of my spirit. Amen? All right? Matthew 6, 12 says, And forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. Okay? So what's a debt? Right? It means that somebody owes you something. Amen? And so a lot of times you can judge whether or not you have truly forgiven a person by asking yourself the question, do I feel like this person still owes me something? Hello, this is important. Do I feel like this person still owes me something? Okay, you've got to release them from that debt. Even if they were 1,010% wrong against you, you've got to release them from that you owe me this in order for me to forgive you thing. Amen? Sometimes you're never going to get the apology, ladies and gents. You've got to make peace with this stuff. Okay, am I saying it's right? No, but God's going to take care of that with them one day. You are responsible for your walk with God, and you need to be in a place of obedience with this. So it says, and forgive us our debts, the things that we owe you, God, as we have also forgiven our debtors. You guys see how this works? You've got to be willing to say, here's your clean slate. I forgive you for this. We're going to move forward. Amen? All right. Now. I always like to preface, I did a status this morning on uh, Facebook and on Instagram that I think is really important to hit. Sometimes when a person is unrepentant and it's an unsafe situation, you still need to use good boundaries. My typical one that I bring up all the time is, you know, if you had an unrepentant sex offender, you know, you would not let them hang out around your children unsupervised. Amen? Truth talk? Okay. So it's not to say that you don't still utilize good boundaries, especially with those who are, un, you know, unrepentant. You know, but it is to say that we still have to forgive in those circumstances, amen? So it does require us to still use wisdom sometimes, okay? All right, 2 Corinthians 2, verses 10 through 11. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs, Amen. This is, again, talking about this area of attack being able to come against your life if you are not willing to forgive people. Amen? This is really, really important, okay? And I know I'm throwing a lot of scripture today, but I want you guys to see this. And just to tell you, this is just a small snippet of what the Bible has to say about this topic. Jesus brings this up over and over and over again, and he's doing it because he wants to warn us. He's doing it because he's trying to say this area is very, very, very important. It's crazy crazy important in your personal life. And so Jesus doesn't want us to fall into Satan's trap with this over our personal lives, which is why he brings it up so much, okay? Matthew 18, verses 21 through 35. Then Peter came up and said to him, Jesus, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times. Then Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. Okay. All right. So here's the deal. I wanted to bring this up too in between looking at scriptures here. Satan a lot of times studies your life as a Christian, and he looks for areas of weakness and areas that you've struggled with in the past. Amen? So if you've struggled with this area of unforgiveness, he'll go, oh, this is the key. This is how I can bring them down. They've struggled with this little unforgiveness area before. I'm just going to keep hitting them with this over and over and over again in their personal life because it'll keep them in this place of being trapped and under attack. Who am I talking to today? You know, the enemy studies your life with a lot of this stuff, and so we've got to be very, very careful. But the way that you break the cycle over this, ladies and gents, is you come out of agreement with the enemy camp. You know, the Bible talks so much about the power of agreement. Have you guys noticed that? So we can, 
you know, either come into agreement with the enemy camp by being in a place of disobedience, or we can reroute. We can come into agreement with God over things and say, God, I want your way for my life. I want your path for my life. You know, I don't want my prayers to be hindered anymore because I've been holding unforgiveness against a person. I don't want, you know, to not have my sins forgiven because I've been unwilling to forgive. I want to get obedient with this stuff, God. But God, you've got to help me. You know, one of the number one things that I prayed to God when I was starting in my journey of getting obedient in this area towards this person is I said, God, I've got to have your help because my flesh is weak in this area. I cannot do this on my own. You know, there were some egregious wrongs that were done against me by this individual, and I've got to have your help. And ladies and gents, God wants to help you in this area. He doesn't want to leave you all out on your own with this. God's going to help you, but you've got to get your heart right and come into agreement with saying, God, I choose forgiveness in order for that help to come, ladies and gents. Amen. Colossians 3.13, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. Again, you notice in all of these scriptures on forgiveness, there's always a reminder that says you've been forgiven by God. If you want God to forgive you, you've got to forgive them. The Bible brings that up for a reason, because those who have been forgiven much are required to forgive much. 1 John 4.20, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. Ouch, right? For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God who he has not seen. This is what unforgiveness does. The Bible says if you're walking in unforgiveness towards someone, your faith is a liar. You're a liar. That's an ouchy moment for us, right? Like, it's painful. It's hard for us to hear, but we need to hear it, right? It says, you know, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he does not, who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God who he has, who he has not seen. Let's, let's break this down a little bit. God is love, right? And so if God forgives, that's his nature, right? That is his nature is a forgiving and loving God. So when we don't align ourselves with that and when we choose unforgiveness, we're not aligning ourselves with love. We are aligning ourselves with Satan. Satan is behind unforgiveness. Satan is behind this root of bitterness, offense, deception in your personal life. And so God says, you know, if you claim to love me and you hate your brother, you're a liar because I am love and I am a God of forgiveness. You guys see how that works? Amen. So this is really, really, really critical. Second Peter 1 9. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. So the Bible describes someone who is walking in a place of unforgiveness as even being blind. They're nearsighted. It means that your focus is off, ladies and gentlemen. And so it says, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Again, those who have been forgiven much are required to forgive much. Ephesians 1, 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, okay? So, here's this concept of grace. If God is giving us grace, and if we want to receive his grace through the redemption of his blood, and through what? The forgiveness of our trespasses, we have to be willing to do that for other people. Amen? All right, and I think it's interesting that when it, this scripture is talking about redemption through the blood, and it's talking about the riches of his grace, and what directly in the middle of those two statements, it says the forgiveness of our trespasses. Amen. So if it's talking about forgiveness directly in association with receiving the gift that Jesus gave us when we receive his grace and forgiveness for our own sins. Amen. This is important. All right. Let me leave you with one more here. Hebrews 12, 15. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble. And by it, many became defiled. Think about those numbers we talked about at the beginning of this whole chat today. Eight out of ten Christians. If eight out of ten Christians are walking in unforgiveness, there's that word many coming into play that we just read in this scripture. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. So that tells you right there that you can fail to obtain the grace of God in your personal lives, ladies and gents. It is possible. A lot of people in Christian culture talk about this concept of, you know, this once saved, always saved kind of a, a mantra. And yes, we receive the grace of God. It is God's grace that saves us. 
But it's not to say that the Bible doesn't also say that we have a part to play with this, ladies and gents. And holding on to unforgiveness can wreck God's plans for your personal life. God doesn't want you walking in unforgiveness. He wants you to be with him in heaven one day. He wants you to get free from this junk. He doesn't want you under attack from the enemy all the time. And that's why he makes a point in the Bible to warn us over and over and over again about the dangers of this stuff, ladies and gents. So we can fail to obtain the grace of God. Amen. That's what the scripture says. And then it tells us how we can fail to obtain it. It says that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble. Amen. That's what happens. And you know what's so hard about this? A lot of the times you get put in this situation where it is so hard to forgive, not even because of your own sin. It's because of somebody else's sin. It's because somebody else is in a bad place in their life and it affects your life. Can we have truth talk today? Doesn't that just seem so unfair sometimes? But I got news for you guys today. We live in a fallen world and it is unfair sometimes. But you know what? It's unfair all the things that we did to Jesus. It's unfair all the sins that we've done in our lives as well, which is why we are required to forgive, okay? So it says that a root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many became defiled. What does that word defiled mean? It means that something is not right. It means that something has been corrupted, right? And so it is very possible for a lot of Christians in the church to become defiled by this. And it doesn't just say that it would happen to a few. It says that it would happen to many. And when that happens, it says that you will fail to obtain the grace of God over your personal life. Wow, I know this is a hard talk today, but this should be getting our attention and this should be a big wake up call for us. All right, ladies and gents. So for the sake of not rambling on for forever, what I wanna do is I wanna have a little virtual altar call today, okay? All right, and so we are all here together. You guys have heard my testimony. This is something that I've struggled with as well in my life previously. So this is a safe place. This is not a place of condemnation, but this is a place where we're gonna deal with this, right? Because I don't know about you guys, but I want my prayers to be heard by Jesus. I wanna be in good standing with him, amen? And I don't want this root of unforgiveness to control our lives, amen? Because that's what it does. When you are in a place of unforgiveness, you are surrendering your control to the person who hurt you, to the person who abused you, amen? And so we have to be willing to forgive, ladies and gents. And so if that's you, if you say, Jill, I have been walking in a place of unforgiveness, I want you to leave a comment. Just say something simple, say, that's me. You know, maybe it's a parent that you have been walking in unforgiveness towards. You know, sometimes people are walking in unforgiveness towards people that are already dead. You're angry and mad at somebody who's not even still living anymore, ladies and gents. It's time for us to let this junk go. It's time for us to get this junk off of our spirits, amen? You know, maybe it's a former boss that you had. Maybe it's a child that has been acting out in your personal life. Maybe it's a friend who betrayed you. Maybe it's a person in leadership at the church. Maybe it was a pastor who really did you wrong. It was supposed to be a safe person. It was supposed to be a person that was good in your personal life. And that very same person stabbed you in the back. Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe a spouse did something horrible, like cheated on you and then went and married another person. Can we have some truth talk? These are not always easy things that we face in our personal lives. And it definitely is not saying that what they did to us was right. Choosing to forgive is not saying what you did to me was okay. It's not excusing that behavior, ladies and gentlemen. It's just saying that, you know what? It's not worth me losing my salvation over this. It is not worth me ending up in hell over this. It is not worth your pettiness. It's not worth you having control over my life, my emotions, my thoughts, my walk with God. Your pettiness is not worth me not receiving the answers that I need via prayer because I am unwilling to forgive you. It's not worth me not being able to live my best life because you did something to me 20 years ago. Hello, who am I talking to today, okay? And so if that's you and even people who watch the replay, leave a comment. Again, this is a no judgment zone. You guys have heard my story. I've walked through this too. I know it's not easy. Been there, done that. Bought the book, right? <laughs> okay, so we're going to walk through this together. So... Um, just pray with me as I pray this prayer, and we're going to walk through this together. So, dear God, I choose today to forgive, and then you insert person's name there, okay? 
God, I pray for everybody who's tuned into this live right now. God, I pray that you would see their hearts, that they are willing to be obedient in this area. God, I pray for healing from the hurt, from the pain, from the abuse of these people and the situations that they have been with. And God, today we choose to align ourselves with forgiveness, God. God, we lift up the names of these people who have hurt us to you right now in Jesus' name. And God, we decree from this moment forward that they do not owe us anything. We cancel the debt just as our debts have been canceled against us. God, we surrender this thing to you. And God, we pray for your intervention over this situation. God, we're taking our hands off so that your hands can be put on these particular situations that we have been facing in our personal lives. And God, I pray that you would help us if we are one of those people who that root of bitterness, that root of offense has really crept up in our personal lives. God, I pray that you would help us to have prayer strategy to pray for these people who are spitefully using us and who are persecuting us in our personal lives, God. God, I pray that you would show us your heart towards them, God, that you would help us to be able to pray for them. And God, I pray that you would show us how to even pray for ourselves as we're trying to get in a place of obedience, as we're trying to get in alignment with what your word has to say over this area. God, we praise you for your faithfulness in our lives. God, we praise you, Lord Jesus, that you forgave us for our sins, for all those times where we failed you, for all the times where we acted out against other people ourselves, even the times when we unknowingly hurt other people, God. God, we praise you that you are faithful to cover us. God, we praise you for your mercy and your grace over our personal lives. So now, God, as people who have been truly forgiven by you, who have been covered and cleansed by your blood, we choose to pour out that same grace on other people today, whether they deserve it or not. God, we didn't always deserve it when you covered our sins. And God, sometimes they don't deserve it, but we choose to give them that grace today. We choose to align ourselves in a place of forgiveness. God, I break off that root of offense and unforgiveness and bitterness from people's lives right now in the name of Jesus. And God, I pray that you would help them to pray into this stuff until they see breakthrough, until the feelings line up, Father God. And God, I pray that you would help us to be obedient with our prayer process on this until we see this thing come to pass, Father God. God, we know that you're faithful. God, we ask for your help in partnering with us on this. We cannot do it on our own, Lord Jesus, but we make the decision this day and this moment, regardless of how our feelings are feeling at the current moment, that we are choosing to get obedient. We are choosing to forgive these people in our personal lives. And God, we thank you for your grace and your mercy over our lives. God, one last thing I pray for people who have been under attack from Satan because of their disobedience. God, for all of those people who just got right with you, all of those people who repented, Father God, God, I break that assignment of Satan off of their lives right now in the name of Jesus. God, I come against this attack. I decree that they are covered and cleansed by the blood of Jesus, that they are now in right standing with the Lord. And God, I pray for your angels to come and to surround them, Father God. I pray for that hedge of protection around their personal lives. And God, we give you every ounce of praise and glory for this time with you today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for tuning in today, you guys. I know this is a hard topic. I know our flesh does not like this, but it's really important that we talk about this. And I'm just so grateful that you guys tuned in today. Hope you guys have a great rest of your day. I'll chat with you soon.